We yeah. have a goodie box of topics. Yes, yes we, we do. do. Oh, that was the third question that I have in uh, in this survey at the end of this, which is um, what future topics that it, once again asking the audience for feedback. <laughs> All right, I think we're, we should be on nearly up on YouTube um, and we're just getting started. So welcome everybody. Uh, as you join, just a reminder that uh, if you are on Zoom to change that little bar from that in the chat window from all panelists to all panelists and attendees, if you wanna to talk to everyone and not just Chris and I. And let's see, I think that covers it. There's, uh, there's a, Two little housekeeping things that I wanna mention. First of all, there's gonna be a survey going out at the end of this session um, that will, I'm gonna switch to gallery view, um, that will, uh, will ask you how you're feeling about the timing of the sessions. We're heading into the fall, so we may be making some changes. Um, so you'll, you can let us know how you feel about the timings. We can't really go outside of work hours because of me, sorry, everybody. Um, but we have a couple, uh, if you wanna go you know, earlier in the day or earlier in the afternoon or ever so slightly later in the afternoon, uh, we might be able to handle that. I think I think school's over for most students at th by 3.30 anyway, but we'll see yeah, what people and, think. And it it kind of depends too on like what's happening with school. Yeah, Are people what's going? happening with school, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I don't really know what's going. So if you can't answer it now, that's all good. We'll leave it running for a couple, for a little while. Um, and then we also have a question about how you feel about the length of the sessions being an hour and a half long and how you, and future topics that you would like us to cover as well. Um, so that'll be going out as soon as you leave this webinar. So it'll take you to that survey and I'll post it on YouTube as well. Um, hello from everywhere. Uh, we have lots of folks from all over the place. Um, and today we're gonna be talking about the planets. Uh, it's a good time of year to be checking out the planets. So that's our main topic today. Um, Chris, did you want to, oh, I, oh, the other housekeeping thing I wanted to mention is that Toronto Center and the David Dunlap, or sorry, no, that's a lie. The Dunlap Institute at U of T are hosting an event just for the planets in September. That's September 12th. Um, and I have the link for that as well um, for the event that is here. It's gonna be all online. They normally have a star party in Toronto where like 5,000 people show up. Um, they're doing it completely online this year. Uh, and so definitely go and check it out. Open to everyone across the country um, and it should be good fun. And I'll be a panelist. Oh, perfect. There we go. <laughs> I will show up in one form or another at some point, but I'm not sure I'm going to be there live. <laughs> um, it should be a good time. I'm going to send out the link on YouTube too. And we'll get going. So Chris, I'm going to handle some of the stuff today for the first time ever. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> co-host, co-present. Sure. Why not? So what I thought I'd gonna... do. Um, yeah. So I'm going to give you the hard parts to explain. <laughs> but before I get to that, I'm going to use Stellarium and, um, and just kind of demonstrate why planets aren't just there all the time. You know, they move around. Let's just show how that works. It's really effective in Stellarium. So I'll just bring that up and we can spend a couple minutes just sort of playing with that. And then we'll get into um, some of your uh, technical um, behaviors of planets. And then we'll break it down and we'll, um, we'll talk about where they are, what to see on them, what you, what equipment you may or may not want to use, and that kind of thing. So let me just bring up my screen here and go here. All right. So um, a cool little feature in Stellarium is um, you know you can bring up the uh, the clock, the the control for the clock, and you can advance the date, you know, by clicking the different day of the month if you want to. Um, but what that does is it, it actually, you know, it'll show you how the sky looks different every night on each subsequent night or a particular date you want. And so we've got a couple of different kinds of ways the sky moves. So the sky moves, you know, east to west during the night if you're living in the northern hemisphere, just sort of hour by hour. So, you know, that's clicking on the hour one. And then night by night, because of Earth's motion around the sun, the stars generally move or over by about four minutes worth of sky every night. So they sort of migrate from east to west as well. And that's why we get different constellations through the year. And then the moon does its thing zipping by, you know, more than a fist diameter every month. But there's a cool little trick in Stellarium and that is you can advance the time by an amount equal to a rotation of the earth, not facing the sun again, but actually facing the same star again. And that's called sidereal rotation. It's different from 24 hours. It's four minutes different from a day. And that's using the alt 
um, the alt uh, minus and equals key. So if I do that, I can advance the date and the star stay put, but you can see the moon hopping around. And what I'll do is I'm gonna zoom in on Saturn and Jupiter here a little bit. And what it's neat is if you do that, you can see how they're moving compared to the stars. And the sky is getting brighter because we're in the evening and the sun sets uh, at a different time. So what I'll do is I'll just make it later. And we'll use that little trick to, um, to demo retrograde motion and things like that. It's a really cool trick you can use. So yeah, you can, you can make the planets move compared to the stars. And that's why the name planet arose is because it means wanderer. It's people notice that the stars stayed were relatively fixed, but the planets seem to change their location with respect to those stars. And if a planet is nearer to the Earth, it has a faster orbit around the sun, so it tends to hop faster or, or more from night to night. And if it's a medium distant planet like Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, sort of in the center of the solar system, you can see the amount that it moved. And then if we get into the outer planets, the uh, Jupiter, uh, Neptune, Uranus, and then Pluto, for those that still consider Pluto a planet, I do, mm -hmm. sort of, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> they, they move too, and I'll show you how they move as well, but they're, they move more slowly, more, um, and they tend to be in the same place year after year. It takes them a long number of years before they sort of move from one constellation to another one. Whereas, you know, inner planets are hopping around all over the place. Mm -hmm. So Jenna, why don't you uh, take it away? I'll just stop sharing here and you can talk about some of the cool things they do. Sounds good. Everyone's favorite thing is technical stuff, but I, I actually do like technical well, stuff. Well, we're here to demystify it. So, you know, we're trying to, <laughs> if it's not clear, ask it. We'll explain it again. We'll explain it again. Yeah, sometimes it takes different explanations for different people. And so I will explain it the way that I, I uh, understand it. But if you need a different explanation, just let me know. Um, for this one, I use a program that we don't uh, typically use, I don't think, which is uh, NASA's Eyes. Um, it is also free, uh, just like Stellarium, and it has just an absolute ton of information about everything you could possibly want. Um, it's not as modifiable, um, so you can't, I, at least as far as I know, I haven't, I maybe haven't spent enough time in it, but it tells you all these extra little satellites and probes and things that are out there. Um, but the key to it is that it shows you also the relative position of everything in, in our solar system and it's fun to explore around. So um, there are, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different things that planets do. Um, we have uh, on Earth, there are a couple planets that are closer to the sun than us, Mercury and Venus. And then there are a couple planets that are further away from uh, the sun than us. And each of those does their own kind of different thing, depending on where they are. So for... Um, for the inner planets, I'm actually going to, there's, they're the only ones that have, um, sometimes you'll hear about greatest elongation uh, instead of opposition. Um, and that's what happens in the inner planets. That's when, uh, that's when we can best see them. And the reason for that is tilted. Oh, and I'm making it worse. There we go. Um, is because, let's zoom in here. We've got Earth in here. Where's Earth go? There's Earth. So we've got Earth right here on its little orbit. Um, and then we have Venus and Mercury in between. And the best time to view them is when they're, and, and best time to view any planet is when it's as far away from the sun uh, as it can be. And for, for Mercury and Venus, that means that they have to be um, as far along their orbit as possible uh, away from the sun. And that's, that's greatest elongation. So that means that when we are on earth and we can kind of zoom in on earth here, we'll let it load. When we're on earth and we're looking up at the sky, the best time to see Mercury or Venus, and I believe we're upside down right now, is when, uh, so if we were looking at this at, this would be sunrise, sun is over here. You can see Venus off in the corner. It's actually just past its greatest elongation. If Venus were further along on its orbit, it would be cl too close to the sun to see. Um, so it'd be a little bit too far away uh, or too, the sun would be in the way of it. Um, so that, greatest elongation of Venus and the greatest elongation of Mercury when they're at the farthest distance away from the sun that we can see them um, is the best time to observe them. With Mercury, that happens a lot because it's going fast. Um, and so that happened the last time. Oh, the next time that's coming up, it's going to be visible at sunset in October. And then it's going to change around and be visible at sunrise as it goes to the other side of the sun in November. So it, it bounces around on either side of the sun really fast. 
Um, but Venus takes a lot longer and wow, okay, let's hide the spacecraft. Um, and that's just because, uh, and we can kind of zoom through this. That's because it takes, it's got a, a wider orbit. It takes longer to go around. Um, we only see it maybe once or twice a year at its greatest elongation, but it stays there for longer. So last time that Venus was at greatest elongation was actually August. It was August 13th. Oh, hey, it's still August. It feels like September, <laughs> but that was in the morning. Uh, so that was at around, that would have been early in the morning and most of us were not up for it. We can still see Venus early in the morning um, because its greatest elongation was only like a week ago or so. Um, but not everybody gets up early in the morning. So the next time that it's going to be at the other elongation, so on the other side um, is going to be October of 2021. So we got a ways to go um, because it takes, it takes a long time to get around. It takes that quite orbit. a while to get to reach those spots. Yeah. So it sort of tends to yeah. park for quite a long time. And it, generally speaking as well, when it goes from um, greatest, I can never remember, greatest west eastern elongation, so visible in the nighttime to visible in the daytime, that seems to, or sorry, in the morning. So going from what it was in the spring this year to now in the late summer. That happens much faster than the other direction because we're going with it on the other as we go along. Seems to take longer on the other side. Um, so those two are a little bit trickier. The the ones in the middle, you do get to see more of them. You get to see more eastern and western elongations, but you only get to see them either in the morning or right after sunset. Whereas with the other planets, wow, um, the outer planets, so Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, those you get um, you get oppositions with. And we've just had a bunch of oppositions and we have a bunch more coming up. Um, oppositions are when the planet is exactly, that our planet Earth is exactly between the sun and whatever planet is on the other side. So um, if we jump back to, let's go to uh, July. Yeah. In July, we had a couple oppositions. Today, this day on July 20th, um, let's see. You can actually line them up quite nicely. So there's there's Earth right here, there's Saturn there, and if you you can actually line all three up in this perfect little line, that day is the day that Saturn was at opposition. So you can see Earth right there, Saturn, and then the Sun. If we go back a couple extra days, and go see when Jupiter was at opposition. A little bit more. There we go. And so then we can line up Earth and Jupiter. That Pluto was right around that time too. And the reason that oppositions are so oppositions and greatest elongations are so sought after by um, astronomers is because those are the times when it is best to view the planets. In the case of the inner planets and the greatest elongations, it's when uh, it's going to be darkest. So uh, and when the planets are going to be highest in the sky, when you can be able to see them. So um, Venus, for example, can get up to like forty-five degrees above the horizon. So you can get a couple hours after sunset or before sunrise of viewing Venus, um, which makes it even a better target than when it's closer to the sun. And with the outer planets, it's when, so that'd be Mars through the rest of them. It's when they're closest to earth and most lit up by the sun as well. So um, they are big, they are bright, they are easy to see, um, which is why Jupiter and Saturn, the best viewing for them is right after, right in the middle, or well, this year it was right in the middle of July. It's also when they spend the most time visible at night. So you can see them pretty much from sunset until sunrise because they're on the opposite side of the sky from the sun. The exciting one that's coming up in October, which we'll talk about a bit more later, I'm sure, and we're also gonna be hosting events for, is the opposition of Mars, which is, I'm actually gonna show you guys, I'm gonna move us ahead and I'm pretty sure this is, yeah, we're completely upside down. There we go. Um, I'm gonna move us ahead until so you'll actually, I believe you'll be able to see, unless I've turned off, I have turned them off. Um, so we are, we're around here right now and Mars is pretty close to us. So you can see it in the sky right now. And then as we get through until September and then into October, we'll be getting close to opposition when Mars and the earth are on opposite sides. And that'll be on the 13th. And so on that day, you can see all three of them lined up. It'll be really, really nice viewing for Mars. It only happens once every two years, 2.1 years or so, um, just because of the way the orbits work. Earth, uh, that's, that's, we end up lapping Mars every two years or so. Um, maybe I'll speed it up so you can see. 
Here we go. That's every 27 months or so. Okay, so just over two years. Yeah. So that goes to be about two years. And now we're going to meet up with Mars later in the orbit a little by a little bit. And that, that's why we're hearing about all these Mars probes is because this is the this is the time when we're closest to Mars. So it's the best time to launch our ship, our spacecraft there. Yes. And if uh, we're going back, going back, um, if I had had the satellites turned on, I'm not sure how to turn them on. Let's see. Um, you would actually be able to see, we'll show spacecraft that way. You'd be able to see, oh, there's so many. Uh, the the <laughs> Mars rover being launched. So there's the Mars 2020 mission there, on its way. Yeah. This is in September. So if you go backwards, you can watch it. You can watch it like rejoin Earth in time. There we go. So it was launched about then. And we need to be close to Mars when we launch these missions. And then it gets to Mars around here. Yeah, we, so we, don't, it, we don't watch this. We don't launch the spacecraft on the date that it's closest to Mars because it takes seven or so months to get there. So it's it's ahead of the game so that it's, it's a shortest trip net result, right? Mm -hmm. It's as short as possible. And so, yeah, it was launched in mid-July. That's why they have those windows available. Um, and then it's not even there by the time we reach opposition. So we reach opposition around here, but halfway there. And then the other half of the trip is after opposition and catches Mars. But cool. because of that, we launch, if you'll notice, if you notice every we only launch, launch Mars missions once every two years or so because of that opposition cycle. Because if we continued forward and through until, let's say, whoa, not that far, um, maybe back into like September 2021 or some other time, the Earth is really far away from Mars at this point. It would be require a lot of energy to send stuff over there. Um, so it makes much more sense just to send stuff during opposition or near opposition. Okay, explaining conjunction. Yes, that's the next one I have to get to. Um, so <laughs> I forgot, it. so this is one of my favorite words. And every time that I stumble across it again, it just makes me so happy, syzygy, um, because it's just got so many Ys in it. S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y, syzygy. Um, and it just means oh, something in Greek. It's like yoked together or something like that. Um, and it's when three things kind of line up, like more or less a straight line in space. Um, and that's special because then we get to See cool things happen like oppositions or um, transits. So every, last November, we saw a transit of Mercury when Mercury passed in front of the sun or between us and the sun. Um, and then uh, and eclipses happen on those times as well. So lunar eclipses, solar eclipses, that kind of stuff happens. Um, and that's also conjunctions. Conjunctions is the other thing that happened. And that's when two objects in space appear to be near each other. Um, so that would be, for example, we have one coming up. Maybe this is one I'll switch over to Stellarium. Um, I actually, I'm going to show you guys just a quick diagram first because I find these, no, I'm going to show you the Google page. Um, there we go. This thing. So this explains all of the different technical jargon. It's just nice to have it all in one spot. So essentially here on Earth, oppositions for the outer planets, they can only happen on the outer planets. Then we have elongations with the inner planets um, and then conjunctions when um, they all line up again, and the sun is in the middle in this case, um, and you can't see them because it's on the other side. Um, so then we have those, that kind of gives you a good like overview and especially with the greatest Eastern and greatest Western elongation, it gives you a good idea of what those actually look like in the orbits of the planets. Okay, switching over to Stellarium and giving my computer a second to adjust between these two programs that use up a lot of internet. Um, in Solarium, uh, we, I'm going to show you guys a couple conjunctions. Um, there are a few coming up that are pretty exciting. Let's share a screen. So um, conjunctions don't have to be just between the planets or just between the moon and stuff. Uh, you can get conjunctions with things that are way, way out in space outside of our solar system. Um, and it just, it's just that like it appears to be near each other. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a couple examples of these coming up. The first one is on September 5th in the evening. Um, so there we go. And if we scoot ahead, we have tonight, we have a Mars and moon conjunction. So Mars and the moon are going to be really close together. Conjunctions just mean that things are close together. Um, sometimes it, uh, you'll get occultations where they over properly overlap. Um, those are a lot rarer than the conjunctions. So in this case, we're going to have Mars and the moon really close together. They are less than a degree apart. So 
that's less than a finger width apart. Um, and I believe, is this the one in some cases that it's going to be an occultation in some, in some places or was that a previous one? For parts of the world, yeah. For parts of the world, okay. Because sometimes they get to see when the Mars peaks out behind the moon or dives in behind the moon. We don't get to see it that time from, this time from Canada, but we still get a pretty good show. Uh, we also have, if you're looking for, so that's two solar system objects, the moon and Mars. And there is a solar system object and a star conjunction happening about a month later on October 2nd. But this one you have to get up really early in the morning. So it's actually not October 2nd in the evening, it's October 2nd at like 4 a.m. Um, so best of luck to everyone, I will be asleep. <laughs> we scoop back to 4 a.m. We have a, oopsies. We have a nice um, conjunction between Venus and the star here, Regulus. They're gonna be really close together and um, they are, I think, half a degree away from each other. Sorry, I'll make that easier to see. Yeah, about the same distance as the moon and Mars were. Um, and if we throw up that, I haven't got it set up the way you do, but if we throw up the binocular circle, you'll see both of them no problem in a set of binoculars. So they're really close together on that one. Um, I'm gonna, do you want me to save the ex extra exciting conjunction that's happening in December until later? Yeah. Well, no, you don't need to save it. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. First, we'll, first we'll recap. Thing... We'll recap it as okay. as we get there. But sure, why not? Sounds good. I'm also going to show you guys one more not exciting conjunction. Sorry to build up the hype before saying that. That way, if anybody wants to wants to tune us out early, they've got the <laughs> they've got, <their laughs> got the information they need, and that's it. Then they can go um, quickly. I just wanted to show you October fourth, and I believe it's at night. Um, we should be able to find, so not first thing in the morning. Oh, that would be the next night then. Uh, we have a moon and M35 conjunction, so they say. Um, I'm going to see if I can. I forgot to check this one. I apologize, everybody. Um, M35. Okay, that's not true. <laughs> but sometimes um, the moon, that is Yeah, sometimes. the moon is with M35 on September 11th. Ah, uh, okay. I got that one. But, but because any, any star or deep sky object that's near the ecliptic will frequently encounter the planets and the moon, right? Because it's true. They're, they're constantly traveling that highway. There we go. So that, that, thank you, Chris, for that one. Um, yeah, and it's true. So you, that's why you get a lot of like moon Jupiter and moon Saturn conjunctions because they're all on that same line. So it happens a, a fair amount. Um, we had a probably the moon Pleiades conjunction happens a fair amount because the Venus Pleiades conjunction happens every year as well. And, and almost every month we get the moon going through the, the beehive, the, yes. the M44. But yeah, this, the time of the year when the beehive is closer to the sun, then we don't get those. But you know, for nine months of the year, we get a pretty good view of that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes in the evening, sometimes before dawn, so. Yeah, so it, it all kind of depends. And especially when interacting with deep sky objects like the star clusters and stuff like that, um, it's better to have binoculars, and even then, sometimes the moon can kind of overpower it a little bit because it's so bright. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, with well, the moon with clusters, you, you almost want to wait till there's a crescent moon doing it rather than a fuller gibbous moon. Yeah, yeah, that helps. So I see in the chat somebody asked whether um, the rings look different at opposition of Saturn, and the answer is no, they don't. But uh, the rings do look different from time to time, and I'll talk about that when we get to Saturn. Okay. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Um, jumping to Saturn. There's a very exciting conjunction happening in December. All of, by the way, all of this that I've been talking about, you can, I got it from various sources, but most of it I got from the Observer's Handbook. So shameless plug for our number one, uh, number one publication. Um, it has all of the interesting things that happen in the year emboldened in the sky, the sky by month section. Um, yeah. Sorry, the sky month by month section. And not only is this event emboldened, which means it's important. It's also italicized, which means it's really important. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, now you know it's serious business. Um, this event is happening on December 21st. So it's gonna be on the around the winter solstice. Um, and it's also going to be right after, let's go to a normal time. Um, it's gonna be right after sunset. Uh, so you'll need a really good view west after sunset, a clear view. So I'm afraid Alberta, you're not going to have a great one because you got mountains in the way. Um, the key is to go up to the top of those mountains and look west. Um, and that conjunction 
is going to be between Jupiter and Saturn. And the reason it's so exciting is because that's not what I wanted. Um, what did I do? Did I turn off my atmosphere? Chris, what have I done? Uh, I don't know. It's just, yeah, I turned off my atmosphere. Just hit P if you want to display, if you want to label the planets, just click P. Okay. Um, Chris is much better at this than I am at knowing Stellarium. Okay, so here's Jupiter. So it is really close to the sun. But if Thankfully, you're... it's the, yeah, it's the, those early sunsets that we get in the, in the winter that let us keep watching these planets, even. In, yeah, it's the planets stay up sun. shockingly late in the, in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. um, so if we go right after sunset, you really need to be like right after sunset because I'm, we're talking like, let's look at this. It's 15 degrees off the horizon is pretty darn low to the horizon. Um, and if you go out at about 530 or so, 515, 530, this is not just Jupiter in there. That is Jupiter and Saturn being so close together. They're, 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 hold on, I'm going to show you. They are like six arc minutes apart. So this yeah. is the degree. That's the arc minute. And there are 60 arc minutes in a degree. So it's a tenth of a degree apart, which is time. It's like you can't even use your hands for that. You can't measure it with your hands at all. You have to, they, it just looks like a bright double star. That's what it's going to look like. And yeah. so close that, first of all, um, in a binocular view, we'll make this a little tiny bit late. No, we won't. Um, get off there. There we go. Um, so we'll make this, yeah, a little bit later. It's, it is visible until 6.30, but um, it's going to be really close to the horizon. Uh, so this is the binocular view. There's yeah. So you want to put your telescope on this one. You want your telescope. Yeah, with the telescope view, let's switch to a one degree. You'll be able to see all of Jupiter and Saturn's visible moons in one field of view in a telescope, which is so exciting. And based on the observer's handbook, this hasn't happened since what, 1632 or something like that. Um, some several years after the invention of the telescope. Um, they haven't been this close together since then. So it's very exciting. Uh, and I am certainly going to be trying to see it, that's for sure. Um, let's see if this tells us. Anyway, yeah, since, yeah, 1623, not 1632. It's been a long time. Um, so definitely get out and look at that. This is also when Jupiter and Saturn, sorry. Yes, Jupiter is passing Saturn in, the, in our sky. So right now it looks like Saturn is, um, this would be, yeah, we've gone a little bit past it. Saturn is on the east left-hand side. Yes, Saturn right is now. on the left yeah. right now. And Jupiter is on the right or the western side, western side, and this day is when they're going to switch positions. So next summer, when you look at them, Jupiter will be on your left one facing south, and Saturn will be on the right, so they'll be switched because they have passed each other in That's the right. celestial race. Okay, let me know if you guys need different explanations because I know I went through that relatively quickly, and it's also, I find orbital mechanics is a little bit tricky to visualize a lot of the time, so if you need other explanations, please do let me know. Um, I think I've covered, oh, Mars, Mars's orbit is, and, and this happens with all the planets. The one thing I haven't covered yet is retrograde motion because Chris has a better diagram for this than I do. Um, you might have seen retrograde motion come up in uh, horoscopes a lot of the time. Um, I don't know what it's supposed to theoretically mean, but in terms of when we're looking at it, it just means that um, whatever you're looking at is moving backwards compared to the stars. So everything that we look at in space over time, and we can do this by going backwards in time, stays, no, you stay centered, um, moves. So, so I use the, uh, yeah, alt, alt equals, we'll, uh, we'll jump them to the stars, try that. Anyway, I'll, yeah. I can show them, I'll show them again. I'll recap I'll, I'll, it again. Yeah, I'll let you, you do it. I'll let you do it because I'm not, sure. I'm not as great. So usually, and maybe this is also, there we go. We're going backwards in time right now. So as you go forwards, objects in space tend to move from west to east. So they're moving towards sunrise, essentially, um, over time, not in an evening. Everything in an evening, when you're watching it, appears to move east to west because of the spin of our Earth. But when you look at it over time, all the things in space tend to move in the opposite direction, except for the period when they go into retrograde motion and they go in the opposite direction, um, or at least they appear to go in the opposite direction due to the backgrounds, uh, compared to the background stars. Um, so that never happens with the moon as far as I can tell, but it does happen with planets. 
And Chris has a better, having never learned about this alt equals trick, which I now know about and I'm excited to try, Chris has it down pat better and also has a way of highlighting the path of the planet and yeah. practice yeah, doing switch so. Over so I can hand it over to Chris. And I'll, uh, I'll give that a go, sure. All right, let me share my screen. Do, 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 do. So what I thought I'd do is, um, is kind of hop through planet by planet and give you a sense of when you can see them, what to look for, what you can see in a telescope or binoculars, that kind of thing. And we're certainly um, open to, to questions um, along the way if there's something that, I, that we forget to mention. Um, one, of the, one of the other things that um, you should bear in mind is this ecliptic. So this, is, this ecliptic is basically the yellow line here. It's the plane of the solar system expressed across the sky. So the sun is exactly on the ecliptic and the planets and the moon are within a few degrees of it, depending on the tilt of their orbit, their orbital inclination. And so from Canada, if you're looking for the planets, they're always going to be in a strip across the southern half of the sky. You'll never see them behind you in the north or straight overhead. If you wanna see planets straight overhead, you have to go to the equator where for them, the ecliptic is overhead. So if you're confused of whether you're seeing a planet or not, ask yourself, okay, where's south? Is the planet that I'm, is the object I'm seeing in the, somewhere towards the southern horizon or southeast, southwest? Chances are that's a planet. If it's not anywhere near there, then chances are it's something else. Um, obviously, as I showed at the, at the very beginning, the planets do creep across the sky, uh, you know, change location compared to the stars. Obviously, they're carried across the sky during the night, the way everything is, because of the Earth's rotation. But if you see something moving faster than that, then it's probably a satellite. So a satellite can easily be as bright as, as, say, the space station can easily be as bright as a bright planet. But the difference is that it's going to be moving as you watch it across through the stars. And you just won't see that with a planet. You'd have to come back kind of night after night after night to notice the planet moving compared to the stars. And as, as Jenna mentioned, the moon um, or Venus near Regulus, um, when those happen, that's a really cool way of seeing the, the, unit, the solar system in action. Because if you look at it the night before and the night of and the night after, you can see the planet hop past the fixed star in the background. So it's kind of neat to make a note and you can really see that happening. Um, all right, so let's, let's start at the beginning. We talked about, uh, Jenna mentioned the inner planets. They do a few things that the outer planets don't do. Um, um, namely that they, they go into conjunction with the sun where we can't see them. Of course, the, the outer planets can do that too, but um, they do it twice in each orbit because once, once they're between us and the sun and the second time they're on the far side of the sun from us, whereas inner planets can never get between us and the sun. They can always sneak around, sneak around the back of it. And because, because they change their location compared to us and the sun, we can see them exhibit phases. So just as we see the moon shows phases, Venus and Mercury also show phases. And at those elongations Jenna mentioned, that's when Venus and Mercury show a half illuminated, a half moon shape, if you want to use the, you know, a slang, a slang expression for it. So maybe, you know, a first quarter, last quarter, or half moon shape. Um, but that's what they do during those elongations. So if you, if you want to see the cool, odd, you know, not round shape of the planet, that's a great time to look at the inner planets when they're at elongations. Now, when they leave elongations and they start heading kind of between us and the sun, that's when they, they wane in phase and they can become very, very narrow crescents. But those are the times where, you know, they're setting right after the sun or rising just before the sun. And you can look at them if you're really careful not to point your telescope or binoculars with the sun above the horizon. You've got to make sure the sun is completely out of view. But if you can catch those planets around that time, you can get the really neat slivers. That and they the, get. and every, every once in a while, you'll see composite photos that people have taken of Venus, where it'll go from that like thicker half full shape. And it also appears much smaller to a much larger crescent shape as it goes through its orbit. And so as I mentioned, the next elongation after sunset, if you don't want to be waking up at four in the morning to do that, um, is in October 20 is on October 29th, 2021. So if you want to give that a try, start practicing now. You have an entire year to get good at it before you start taking pictures of Venus. So what I've done is I is I've, I've made my horizon flat just so that I can I can 
tuck up close and see the inner planets without them being obscured by trees or, uh, or buildings or hills or anything like that. So Mercury, the speedy little planet, goes around the sun every 88 days. But because we're viewing Mercury from an Earth that's also orbiting the sun, it doesn't sort of go through its cycle exactly every 88 days because by the time it's done a cycle, we've also moved. So that's, the geometry is a little more complicated than that. But basically the Mercury ends up in the same spot roughly every three months or so, three and a half months or so. And um, as Jenna mentioned, there are two more times when Mercury is gonna be uh, nicely visible for us this year. One is uh, on October 1st, but it's actually the, the nights, the, the date, the times around October 1st. So that's gonna be an evening. So let me see if I can find Mercury here and put it in view for us. There's, you can already start seeing Mercury. Let me get it into view here and I'll just go back in time. So there's Mercury, Mercury's tucked in close to the sun. So this is, this is now. And over the next number of days, you can see that Mercury is swinging wider away from the sun, making a greater angle. I'm just gonna put on, you can go into Stellarium and you can show the orbits. And that kind of shows the path Mercury's gonna take. So it's, it's right now, it's, you can see from the distance that it's 0.408 astronomical units. Now the distance from us to the sun is 1.0 AU. So that means that Mercury is half of that, which means Mercury is between us and the sun, right? So if we zoom in on Mercury, we should be able to see that it's, where are we here, 4408, just from the sun. Well, oh, sorry, distance from us is 1.3. So it's on the far side of the sun from us. That's why it looks more than, more than half illuminated. And over the next little while, it's gonna be waning in phase. So if you use your telescope on it, again, be careful of the sun. And let me just go back a little bit here so we can see the horizon. So you can see, Every day it's gonna be getting farther from the sun, which is here, but look at the angle that the ecliptic, this is the plane of the solar system. This is you know, Mercury's orbit. It's very, very shallow. We call that very, very shallow. And that means that Mercury never really gets much higher than the sun is after sunset. And so the, the time between the sun goes down and Mercury goes down is very brief. And that means that Mercury is gonna to be tough to spot. The sky won't get dark for us before it disappears. So you can see even here, it's only a couple of degrees above the horizon. That's just barely a couple of fingers above the horizon. And so this is what are gonna be considered a poor appearance for Mercury for anybody who lives in the Northern Hemisphere. But if you're lucky enough to travel to the South, which we can't do very well right now, but no. people live in the South, if you take Stellarium and you travel South, look what happens to the ecliptic as you move South, it tips up and up and up. And so by the time you get towards the equator, and everybody who's been had a trip to the tropics knows how it gets dark so fast at the equator and how sunrise fa happens fast at the equator. It's because things are moving straight up and down. So this appearance of Mercury during October is gonna be fantastic if you live at southerly latitudes or in the Southern hemisphere, because Mercury is gonna be sort of above the sun and once it's gone, the sky gets dark and you'll get some great views of Mercury. So I'll just put this back to where we were, but by the time this, by the time this uh, appearance is finished, so the, about the, the peak, as Jenna mentioned, is around October 1st. It's gonna be widest from the sun. So you can see when it, let me just bring this up here a little bit. October 1st is gonna reach its greatest elongation at the tip of that curve. But look how low it is, it's just crazy low. So it's not really convenient for us to look at it. It's sitting way below the plane of the solar system. That makes, that's what makes it tough. And then Sorry. after that, Go ahead. I was planning out the Explore the Universe. Um, we run a second live stream on every other week on Thursdays where we go through some targets and Mercury is one of them. And I was planning out that that course and I was looking at this and going, Mercury is the greatest elongation. Why is it so hard to see? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, there's, there's more to the story and that's why we're doing this, right? We wanna give people a great idea. So hopefully people are, people are making notes and getting their calendar set so they can sort of plan ahead a little bit. So. Once this uh, reaches elongation, it's now gonna start heading back towards the sun again. Its distance is gonna be less than one AU. So it's heading in between us and the sun. And over the early part of October, I'll just keep bringing the sunset down a little bit. You can see it's heading back again. So it's kind of really, it's game over. So we're done, we're done seeing it until it gets through its meeting with the sun or its conjunction. So let's just bring the sun back into view here. 
So Mercury will, will sort of pass the sun invisibly. We can't see it when it's near the sun in late October. And then once it, once it reaches um, west of the sun, then it becomes a morning object. So I pop this back down to the morning sky. And as we advance in late October, look how fast it jumps away from the sun. So I'm just going to bring this here. And now you can see how steep the ecliptic is. So the Mercury is almost straight over the sun. That means that this appearance in early November is going to be among the best of the whole year for seeing Mercury for us. So, and, it, and we've got a big long stretch of time. We've got a number of weeks that we can see it. So let me just bring this up. That's, yeah, and the, the date itself is November 10th, but that'll yeah, be- Yeah, but even, even starting on the first, you see how even on the first, oh, wow. the sky will be plenty dark at six, you know, after six in the morning. So you, you've got at least a couple of weeks, three weeks to see Mercury at this in, in November. So it'll be a dead easy time for you to catch this. You know, and it's not something everybody has seen, but if you know what you're doing, it's really easy to find it and see it. So, mm -hmm. so there you go. And around mm -hmm. the 10th, yeah, we hit the peak of the, the orbit. There it is, yeah. The, um, the other option when you're looking for Mercury, although this is not a short-term option, we had a conjunction in some time when the weather was good. Cause, and it, yeah, it was... COVID had already happened. So it was sometime in the spring um, we had a conjunction of Mercury and Venus. And that was really nice because Mer Venus is so bright that it was like, okay, find Venus first and then find Mercury. Um, otherwise yeah. it ends up, so that helps a lot is waiting for those conjunctions or like signposts to help you with it. Yeah, actually that's a really good point. One of the, one of the easiest ways to see Mercury is to wait for the date when the moon is nearby. Let me just see if I can find that. That's a good point. Yeah, I use, I use the moon all the time to find, here we go. There's, okay, there's Venus. Let's see if we can go back. Let's go back forward in time. So here we go. Okay, here we go. So here's the moon. November 12th, 13th, we're going to have the Venus, the moon, and Mercury oh, all hanging perfect. out together. That'll be a beautiful image. I mean, um, again, we'll have a nice dark sky. Mercury will be, so Mercury's brightness will be minus 0.7 and Spica is plus. So Mercury really will be pretty easy to identify it because it'll be brighter than any other star or anything nearby. So yeah, so if you're, this is a cheat, this is gonna be dead easy to see it, but, but there are lots of times where the moon will be hanging out near Mercury and, um, and if you look for the moon, then we will tell you, you know, look to the lower left of the moon and you'll see a spot Mercury, that kind of thing. So yeah, there's one to put in your, uh, in your notes. All right, so that's Mercury. Let's see if I had anything else to say about Mercury. Did you know that the, um, the five naked eye planets, so Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the easy naked eye planets. In China, they were named after the five elements. So soil, water, fire, uh, metal, and uh, what did I miss one? Fire, water, wood, um, wood soil, wood. water, metal. Yeah. yeah. So, so actually Mercury's Chinese name is uh, Shui Xing. It's the water star, they call it in China. In, in China, ancient Chinese astronomy. Hmm. All right, let's go back to today and we'll talk about Venus. Just pick up a few of the other points about Venus. And here we go. So we've got Venus, Venus is hanging, hanging around. And again, in Stellarium, if you pop on the orbit option, then you can sort of get a sense of that, you know, that, that, that elongation idea. So the sun's down here. So we're looking at Venus on its outer it's just recently past the outer tip of its orbit. So the elongation was a few days ago, and now it's starting to slowly descend back towards the sun. Uh, in a telescope, right now, if you get up early, Venus will show that half illuminated phase, which is typical of it being at the elongation of its orbit. And then in the coming weeks, you're noticing both the amount of illumination of the disk is changing a little bit, but also the size of the disk is changing. Did you notice that? So if we stay now, see how Venus is getting a little smaller as I go in forward in time? Because it's getting farther from the Earth. So Galileo, Galileo um, noted the size changes of Venus's disk and the phases, the phase differences. And that helped him understand that the way that it looked and the way it behaved, it must be a sphere, it must be moving around the solar system in a particular way. And working that out. In China, uh, uh, Venus is the uh, gold star, Jinxing, Jinxing it's called, it's cool. All right, so as you mentioned, we've got Venus, 
We'll hang out in the morning all the way to the end of the year. It's going to be there until, and by the way, oh, there's the, uh, there's that M44. Yeah. And we had, I don't know if you noticed, did you see the moon was there a minute ago? Let's see if I get the moon. Was it? There's the moon. Oh yeah, there moon. it is. So yeah. the moon, so on, on the 14th of September, we're going to have the bright Venus, the crescent moon, and the, um, the beehive cluster I bet you all in the same. And, and asteroid Vesta. And Vesta, yeah. I bet you if you go back like an hour or two, the moon will be almost directly on top of M44. Yeah, so hour by hour, yeah. the moon, yeah, moon hops around. If so I go cool. back earlier in that night, see that you have to wait till it rises though, that's the only mm -hmm. thing. But uh, the trick for seeing the, the, the star cluster is to, is to park the bright objects outside of the field of view of your binoculars, hide them, and then leave the dimmer object in view. Hmm. But then, and once you see it, you can sort of add them to the field. So that's Venus. Now Venus, Venus and Mercury are in a telescope, but a backyard telescope. They're going to look like a um, a featureless blob, you know, of a shape. Venus shows its shape much more clearly than Mercury would show its shape because it's bigger, a bigger disk. But um, and because they also tend to be near the horizon, we're looking at them through lots more atmosphere, so they tend to swim, be a little blurry in the telescope. But if you're patient and you look for a few minutes and wait for those for the air to steady up. You know, you'll get that. You'll notice that uh, that shape showing up. So here we are, heading into late September. Let me just bring the hour. This is five in the morning, six in the morning. You can see it's dropping down, drop past Regulus as you pointed out, and then it's going to head down, 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 down. It takes a long time to do its thing, and then we get into November. It's going to meet up with Mercury. Oh, it, see Mercury, it was getting close to Mercury, but then because Mercury's faster, it, it's speeding so away. So it. it, we're not going to get them together this time around. No, that's okay. And and um, Eric Briggs was pointing out in the YouTube chat as well that um, Venus's orbit is very, I mean, all the orbits are relatively predictable, but Venus's orbit is very consistent over eight years. It stays yeah. very, very similar over eight years. Um, and so we get the same events happening every eight years. So things like Venus always visits the Pleiades every eight years. It always, um, it always not occults, it always conjuncts with Regulus every eight years. And one time it did actually occult Regulus. Uh, and so we get, yeah, we get different closeness, but the same events happening every eight years. So if you miss something, don't worry, it'll come around again. And because of the, the, this, the, the object sizes are small, it really depends on where on earth you are too. It's like an eclipse. If you're not sitting in the right country or the right part of the world, you may or may not catch it actually. Especially, especially with, you know, if you look at the eclipse, at least that there's this nice big wide area where you can see at least some of it because yeah. the moon and the sun are so large. But if you look at Venus and Regulus, they're so tiny. Yeah, the, 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 um, the precision is a lot more, a lot more exacting. Yeah. Yeah. So what I did is I stopped here on March 28th next year. So that's when Venus will be in conjunction with the sun. And after that date, then Venus will enter the evening sky and we'll spend um, probably months uh, in 2021 as an evening star, so-called evening star that people call it. All right, let's go back and let's go back. This is now back to now and let's look at tonight. And we might as well go in order. Let's, let's do Mars. Let's do Mars. <laughs> so Mars, right now Mars is not rising until about uh, after 10 p.m but it's, we're rapidly, we're rapidly uh, catching up to it on the inside track of the solar system. And so with even within a couple of weeks, it's gonna be rising much earlier. And by the time we get to early October, it's gonna be rising right at sunset. And sunsets in, in, in early October are already getting earlier. So it's gonna be an all night target. So if you would see if I advance the date here, you can see it rises earlier all the stars rise earlier by four minutes every day, just automatically because of Earth's orbit. But at the same time, Mars, you think Mars is traveling through the stars and it is. And let me just show you, I'm just gonna take off the orbit for a second just to make this clear. All right, so I, actually I can put on the track. So you can draw the trail of the star just by clicking show trails. So now if I sit here and I go um, alt equal, I can show the orbit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back in time first. Let's go back. All right, so this is back in July. 
And every day Mars was scooting along, east along the ecliptic, that's prograde motion, regular motion. It's counterclockwise as viewed from the top of the solar system looking down. So from our point of view, things go right to left, All right? So here's the prograde motion. And because the earth is, is overtaking Mars on the inner track of the solar system, it's like if you're driving on the highway and you've got the mountains in the distance and you overtake a car, as you're overtaking the car, it's moving forward with respect to the mountains. But as you overtake the car, the car looks like it's going backwards compared to the mountains, right? And then, it, and then that, that analogy only works for half of this because we're not, the, we're not going in a circle on the highway, but, <laughs> but that's basically what we're doing is that the stars are in the background and they're in their spot and we're overtaking Mars. So we're gonna change the parallel, it's a parallax effect. Okay, I had the... such a hard time with a good visualization for that because yeah. like I've heard the racetrack, but without a background reference, it doesn't make any sense. So you do need yeah. that background reference. Yeah, so as we, as we get up into, so here we are. So we're heading into late August, now we're September 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th. Let me just get my date here. So I have the right date da, 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 da. on the 9th. So let's get here, right? So on the 9th, Mars will stop moving. And right now you can see it's inside this V of Pisces. These stars aren't very bright, but if you have a dark sky location, you can pick up the V-shaped stars of Pisces. And Mars is gonna, is gonna hang around inside them for a while. So once we, once we overtake, start overtaking it, then compared to the distant stars, Mars will seem to start heading backwards. It's still going forward in its orbit. It's just that we're faster, so we're overtaking it. And that's gonna happen until, all right, so here we have on the 6th of October is the night when Earth will be absolutely closest to Mars for this, for this uh, meetup. So that the distance between the two planets will be at their minimum. But that's, a, that's different from opposition because of the way the geometry and because Mars is moving and Earth is moving. The actual opposition date when Mars, the sun and the Earth line up happens a week later, that's gonna happen on the 13th of October, but on the 6th, and we're scheduled to be um, online, you and I on the 6th, so we can, yeah. we can focus more on Mars then. But, so here we are, this is the closest date on the 6th, but really anywhere in that week, if you get a clear night and you wanna look at Mars, that's your chance. And I'm gonna talk about what to look at in a minute. October 12th is the opposition date, but then we're not done the retrograde. We haven't finished overtaking Mars in our orbit. So that retrograde motion lasts for another, month until November, in a minute I'll make it dark again. So around November 15th, it's gonna, it's gonna finish its retrograde loop. And then both Mars and Earth are gonna be moving prograde compared to the stars. And so then it'll continue its backwards to its normal motion. And so if I advance the date into the nighttime, you can sort of see, I'll just do this. So there's your retrograde loop. So it's going regular forward, temporary reversal, and then continue going forward. And depending on, so all the outer planets do those retrograde loops and the size and length of the loop depends on their distance away from the sun because um, Mars being a relatively close planet to us, it's gonna be, uh, what is it, a couple of months or uh, yeah, two month long retrograde loop, but um, Saturn and Jupiter will be a shorter retrograde loop and Uranus and Neptune have a different length. And we can, we can demo them if you want to. Now, let me go back and I'm just gonna take out the track here because I wanna show you what to look at on Mars. And let's go back to now. So we've been actually overtaking Mars for quite a number of months now, but it's taking its time for that to happen. I'm just gonna put this to the 23rd. And let me just bring Mars into view here. And I wanna give you a sense of the difference. So I'm just gonna magnify Mars, pretend we're looking at it with a telescope. This is the view now, this is the view, whoops, I have to turn off the earth here so you can get a view. I'm just gonna turn off the, the ground. So look at the difference. This is back in April, May, June, July, August how much bigger the Mars's disk is getting as we're getting nearer to it. 
here's September, and then opposition or the, the closest date, that's October 6th. And then very quickly afterwards, it'll start shrinking again within a couple of months, just by the way the geometry of the solar system works. Now, in a backyard telescope, when Mars is at opposition and it's only, um, I have the note here, it'll be four, four light minutes away from Earth at, op at closest approach. So that's only uh, 0.8, sorry, 0.5 astronomical units or 78 million kilometers. Now, even a backyard telescope, if, you're if your seeing conditions are good, if, you're, if your air is steady, you can start seeing the bright and dark patches on the planet. And you can see the bright white dot of the polar cap. Now, the, Mars has actually just reached its northern winter, or it will, uh, on September 2nd, which means that the south pole of Mars will be tipped towards the sun and towards us as we're getting close, almost between Mars and the sun. So the polar cap of Mars will look like a bright white spot on the, near the disk of the planet. And depending on your telescope, your telescope might flip Mars upside down. So the bright spot might be at the top instead of the bottom, depending on your, whether you have a refractor or reflector and that kind of thing, or a star diagonal. But look for that bright patch on either side. And because Mars rotates, everything in the sky rotates as it crosses the sky. So that, that bright patch will move around Mars during the night. So if you're looking in early evening or midnight or before dawn, it'll change its location. Now, Mars rotates on its axis, just like Earth does. And our day is 24 hours, but Mars's day is, is 20, let's see if I have it here, 24 hours and 37 minutes. So that means that if you look at Mars every single night, Earth time, every Earth night, Mars will have moved a little insufficiently. It hasn't completed a rotation night after night on Earth. And so that means if we, if we point our telescope at Mars every night, we get to see a different piece of Mars. If you make a, um, a project of looking at Mars over a few weeks, you can eventually see the whole disk as it rotates around. And you can look for um, bright features and dark features. So I mentioned the polar caps. You can also look for this, this big dark triangle area. Let's see if I have the, uh, the triangle here noted. I'll just bring this up. I have a neat picture that I, that I saved. Okay, go here and sorry, I should have had this ready to go. Oh, nice. So yeah, here, this is, um, okay. so this is a gentleman that took a series of photographs of Mars and there's that polar cap I mentioned at the bottom. And then he actually assembled this orthographic map showing Mars. So the, the dark triangular wedge shape is called Sirtis Major. So you can look for that one. You can look for the, um, the bright Arabia area to its uh, to beside it. And again, the orientation will depend on your telescope. So this may be upside down for you, depending on your telescope. But it'll definitely be, um, you can sort of see around the equator of Mars, you've got um, the white area, the bright areas, the Amazonas and Tharsis areas. Then you've got the, um, the Sinus Meridiani, Meridiani area. Then you've got the Sirtis Major area. So it's fun. So when you're looking at Mars to do a little sketch and then go back to a Mars map and see if you can match up what you saw. Do you think we would actually, you'd be able to see these dark spots with like a six inch telescope, let's say? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Even um, even a, an 80 millimeter, three inch refractor. Um, if you watch carefully and wait for the, the air to be steady, you can definitely see the, the modeling effect, the bright Cool. Dark. And some people have the, um, the, colored, the colored filter sets with their eyepieces. So if you put a red filter on, you can enhance the contrast and you can play with the, the appearance of the planet that way. Now, Phobos and Deimos are Mars's two moons. They're going to be at their brightest when we're closest to the planet. And so those are your kind of best opportunities if you have a smaller telescope to see them. They're tricky. You need a, I've only seen them in a big, big telescope. But um, if you use an app or Stellarium or something to tell you where to look for them compared to Mars, then you can maybe see if you can spot them. They're you know, they're, they're no dimmer than, than a regular star, but they're tucked in close to Mars. Mars is a bright sort of halo, bright 
blob, you need to wait till they're you know far enough away from Mars so that its glow, its halo, doesn't obscure them that much. Anybody have any questions about Mars? I think that's good enough for now. So far, I haven't seen any, but I did. I don't, are you going to address the asteroid belt objects? Because I wanted to throw out Ceres quickly. Throw it out. What's Ceres next? is at opposition on Friday. Um, it's Friday's not a good day to see it because the moon's going to be up. But Ceres is one of the, is it even a minor planet? Yeah, it is because it's round, right? No. Yes. Yeah, it's called it. It's, it'll be considered a dwarf planet now because it's round, it's self round. It's round, yeah. Let's look for Ceres. Um, so Ceres is round, and Ceres is also exciting for several reasons. One of which is that they recently um, determined that it is extremely likely that there is an ocean underneath it, um, and that there are all these salt deposits on the surface, which is super cool. Um, also, in the photo in which uh, the, that was included in the press release, it looks a whole lot like one of the sci-fi series that we briefly mentioned a couple weeks ago, <laughs> which is The Expanse. Um, it's a very important uh, minor body in that series. And that particular photo looked a lot like something that occurred in the series. So that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, so series is near the horizon. It's gonna be a little tough for us. Um, you can look for this bright star named Fomalot or Fomalhaut. Um, and it's, it's a few degrees above that. Um, just for reference, so there's Saturn and Jupiter, okay? So just to give you kind of a context, and then Mars is down here. So at, at about 10.30 p.m. tonight, we've got Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and Ceres, Ceres is sort of midway between them and below. And um, also, as being an asteroid, it moves just like the planets move, so we can do our trick with the alt equals, oh, nice. and you can see how it's moving retrograde, right? So anything in this sort of area of the sky right now, this sort of quadrant of the sky is moving retrograde because it's in that patch of the sky that Earth is overtaking. Any solar system objects, not the moon in that part of the sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. except the moon, yeah. Good point, all right. So that's Ceres. Anything else you wanted to say about Ceres? We can move on. No, it's okay. I was, I was, I was just really excited about Ceres. It's, it's, if you ever get the chance, and I know I've already said this a million times, but read that book, The Expanse, it's so good. Okay, I'm done. So, so let's do Jupiter and Saturn kind of together quickly. They're easy to see, they're obvious. Uh, Jupiter is, I think it's about 10 times brighter than Saturn. So it pops out of the, the twilight sky first. Um, as soon as the sky starts getting dark, you should be able to pop, you should be able to notice Jupiter uh, in the southeastern sky uh, these days. And Jupiter and Saturn are both near one another. They're both in their retrograde part of their orbits now because we're overtaking them. So you can see they're both heading backwards compared to the stars. I'll just make this a little darker. And you can see that the moon was there. So the moon is gonna hang out with uh, Jupiter on the 28th and with Saturn on the 29th. So that's a cool thing to look at. Now in Jupiter, in a, in a small telescope, you can see Jupiter's um, four moons, the Galilean moons. That's four of, of perhaps 72 or so moons that Jupiter has, but the four big ones, the terrestrial sort of moons. Um, and they, they, they have orbits that are on the period of days, hours and days. So they actually will hop around Jupiter from night to night. And some of the cool things that you can do with those moons, you can magnify here, let's make this. So because Jupiter is a big globe and it actually casts a shadow, you can actually um, find times when the moons disappear suddenly because they, Jupiter is blocking the sun from reaching them. Or if they're coming out from behind Jupiter, you can see them pop into view when they become illuminated after they leave Jupiter's shadow. I did notice, I did note a couple of them. Yeah, so on August 30th at 10.30, let's see if I have this, 10.27, 27. So where's Io? Let's see if we can find Io here. Let's see if I can find, maybe that's not the one I was thinking of. Oh, I'm no, this is, I'm thinking about a shadow transit for Io. Because, because Jupiter's moons cast little black shadows, you can actually see the shadows more easily than you can see the moons with a telescope. So even a, a smallish telescope, a four inch, six inch telescope on a good night seeing where the air is steady, you can see the little round shadows cross Jupiter. Um, and they take, depending on whether they're crossing near the top or the equator, they can take up to 
several hours to cross the planet. Every once in a while, we get two at the same time. And then every once in a while, we get the red spot as well. I think we mentioned that a couple of weeks ago in one of our sessions that we had those. Yeah, there was one, there was one maybe two weeks ago, I think. And was... you can go to the, uh, the calsky.com or you can use an app and you can figure out um, when these events are happening. Um, the other one I wanted to point out was the next, here on the first, towards midnight. I'll come back here a little bit. Okay. I believe, I mean, if you're really interested in looking at charts, um, you can also find the shadow transits in the uh, handbook and the observer's handbook, except you have to look for, I mean, it's looking through pages of acronyms, which makes it a little bit trickier. Yeah. Now you can see here, I've got Io, I've got Ganymede. Now Ganymede will be invisible until about midnight and suddenly around 1159, see how Ganymede suddenly gets brighter here? So it's hmm. leaving the shadow of Jupiter and now the sun is shining on it and it's bright again. Cool. So you can find those cool sort of things that are happening all the time. Um, there's a few more, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into them all because we're getting a little a low on the time. So you can look for the, um, if you have a, a telescope that's, that's reasonably good quality, you can look for the, the equatorial bands on the planet. So you should look for the bands, you should look for the, the four moons and you might only see, you could see as few as one or two or you could see all four depending on whether they're in front or behind or in shadow or lit, depends on that. Um, the great red spot, so the great red spot takes about three hours to traverse the planet and because Jupiter orbits every 10 hours for us on Earth, we get to see the red spot about every second or third night. So again, you can use an app or a, Skyntel has, a, has a, um, a tool, online tool you can use or the handbook has uh, lists of when the moons and the various um, things on Jupiter are visible. Uh, let's see, we talked about Saturn. So right now, Jupiter and Saturn are together in the sky. They're about a, not quite a fist diameter and Jupiter is faster. Jupiter orbits the sun every 12 years, 12 years to orbit the sun. Jupiter, uh, Saturn takes 30. So Jupiter generally overtakes Saturn. And as you said, next year at, on this date, so if I put Saturn, if I put Jupiter in the middle here and I pop ahead a year from now, then now Saturn is off on the, on the right. So Jupiter has lapped it. Lapped it, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Saturn, let's talk Saturn for a second. Now, Saturn has a tilt on its axis. So Jupiter doesn't, and that's why Jupiter's moons always seem to form a line, because Jupiter is sitting upright and the moons are orbiting in the same plane. But because Saturn has a tilt on its axis, not too much different from, this, from the Earth's tilt, then that means that we look down on the, well, right now we're looking kind of looking down on top of Saturn's system. So Saturn's North Pole is visible here, and then the disks, the rings are open to us. Um, I'm just going to turn off the ground and the sky and I'm going to put this advance up year by year and watch what happens. This answers to that question that somebody put in the chat a, a little while ago. So this is this is now, this is next year, next year, next year, next year. And in around March of 2025, we'll see the ring's edge on. So in a backyard telescope, Saturn will look naked. It won't really, we won't really see the rings for maybe a couple of weeks until they start to creep open again. Uh, so that's, that's kind of cool. And you can actually use Stellarium to figure out the exact date that they're lined right up. They're around somewhere around the end of March, 2025. So mark your calendars. So that's a cool aspect of looking at Saturn. Um, Saturn's rings are Saturn's moons are pretty substantial, just like Jupiter's um, moons are. And in a, you know, in a modest telescope, you can see, definitely you can see Titan. So Titan is the brightest, biggest moon of Saturn. But you can you generally pick up, if it's a dark night and good sky, you can certainly see three, four, five, six moons of Saturn in your telescope. Really? And that's where using an app is really neat to figure out, am I seeing, I, I think I'm seeing a little point of light just off the end of the rings, is that one of the moons? And you can figure out which one it is and so on. And again, you need to figure out how your telescope flips the view so that you can, you can match that to the app so you can get things oriented. Uh, using Titan and the rings would certainly help you figure out the orientation of that. 
Uh, let's see. So we're we're not much far past opposition on Jupiter and Saturn. So there's still really good objects to look at. They're already though they're already kind of in the western half of the sky. So let me just put the sky back up here. Once they get past opposition, then they're really uh, beginning the end of their uh, visibility for the year. So, but because we have the earlier sunsets of the fall, then that'll that'll maintain them in the dark sky for the next couple of months. So, so here's uh, here's October. Uh, sorry, um, August, and then by let's go back into the evening. Here's about 9 p.m. in September, and then October, and even by November, as you said, and December. We can still spot them and they get, of course, Jupiter is overtaking Saturn around the 21st. That's that max. So you can, you can, you've got lots of time to, uh, to take a look at those and it'll be even really cooler. Um, and as I said, next year, they'll be back. Um, they'll, they'll soon, once we get into January or so, let me just bring this back. You can see that they get into conjunction with the sun and then they'll reappear in the, in the pre-dawn sky for the early part of 2021 and then we'll have to pass through the spring before we can start looking at them again for next year. That's our time doing here. We still have about 15 minutes or so. The nice thing about um, the planets though as well is that oftentimes you'll you know you'll see like Venus, no sorry not Venus, um, Jupiter and Saturn will dip down too close to the sun. Um, if you're really dedicated, you can see them for like a good nine months, 10 months of the year, if you're willing to get up in the morning. It's just that um, it's only, if you wanna only get up in the evening, you can only really see them throughout like the summer, fall. Um, but you still could theoretically go out and observe them if you wanted to in like February. Oh yeah, no, once they once they clear the sun again, they start entering the pre-dawn. They're really available for a long time, as you said. But you need that dedication to get up early. I'm not. I'm not, that, a, that... I'm not a morning guy so much. So nope. <laughs> I wait. I wait until they come back. But um, yeah. But yeah, they're well worth seeing. And that that's another point is that um, because the planets are on a different schedule than the Earth and the Sun is, so you can't say every July I'm going to look at planets because they're just not there every July, right? They're there. They're sure they happen to be the summertime planets. The other the other interesting twist is that. In the summer, the ecliptic isn't very high above the horizon, right? So we're all a little bit sad that our views of Saturn and Jupiter and, and even Mars this year won't be as crisp and clear as we like because they're not going to be up where the air is thinner, higher in the sky. And it really won't be, now for Jupiter, it'll be, Jupiter jumps by about one constellation or one zodiac constellation a year. So within a couple of years, Jupiter will, will transition from a summertime planet to more of an, to more of an autumn or spring. You know, I, I forget which it is, but um, it'll, it'll start autumn, rising right? higher in the sky. Yeah, it'll be arriving sooner in the year, so it'll become a spring planet rather than a summer planet. And Saturn will get there too. It'll just take a bit longer because it's a slower orbit. Um, yeah, so that's Jupiter and Saturn. Um, meanwhile, you may have noticed Neptune was noted here. So Neptune is actually... Mars is actually sitting kind of between Neptune and Uranus, the outer gas giant planets. So they're available, you know, in late evening for the rest of the night right now. Uh, Neptune, you really wanna try to catch Neptune when it's higher in the sky. So Neptune is actually highest at around 2.30 in the morning, but you know, I don't have to wait till 2.30, but if you can catch it in late evening, it'll be higher and you'll be seeing it through the less of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, Neptune, I love to watch. I love to look at it in my telescope because it's such a pretty blue color. It's so distinctively blue. So it's a really great one to look at. But its disk is tiny. I mean, the, the size of Jupiter's disk is about, let's see here, 45 arc seconds. Okay. The size of Neptune's disk is only, where's it here? There we go. Six. Six. So it's only about a fraction of Jupiter's. So if you imagine how big Jupiter looks in your telescope, then when you want to look at Neptune, you can you can see that proportionately it's a lot tinier. But um, as I said before, Jupiter, or sorry, Neptune being an outer planet, it moves pretty slowly compared to the stars. Um, so it's in Aquarius this year. I think it's in Aquarius next year too. It takes a long time to move from constellation to constellation. Um, this, this set of um, 
of stars, pi door, which is lambda, and we have phi, I think it's phi. Is that phi right? And psi. I, I, think I, I think I remember them. Anyway, Neptune is sort of, these are, these are kind of naked eye stars, certainly using binoculars. And so if you sort of use those as your reference, this triangle of stars, and you'll know that Neptune is sitting here about, I think it's about two degrees. Yeah, about two finger widths or about two degrees to the east of those stars to help you find it. Um, the handbook often mentions when the moon is beside Neptune and that, forget it. Don't bother looking for Neptune when the bright moon is here because it overwhelms the planet. The planet is very dim, 7.82. But it's certainly, uh, but binoculars, if you know where to find it, you can see it binoculars when the moon isn't around. And, uh, and look for that blue color. It's really, really spectacular. So basically you want to point your telescope where, the, where it is and look for whatever seems really blue. They'll all look like stars at low power, but the blue one will be Neptune and then you can, mag you can center it and magnify it. Uh, just to wrap up here, uh, Uranus. So Uranus, uh, let's see, it's going to be opposition on October 31st. Yes, right and when the full blue moon is up. Yeah, and it'll be 156 light minutes away from us at that time. So you're seeing it that much in the past, 156 minutes wow. ago when you look at it. Um, I'm going to go back to Neptune in a second. I forgot to mention something. Uh, it'll have a disk size of about three point arc seconds at that time, I think. Yeah, apparent diameter, 3.6 arc seconds, somewhere in there. Um, so it's again, it's a little tiny disk. It's blue green, sort of more greenish than bluish. Um, but it's a cool one. And you can use, um, to, to get yourself in the neighborhood, for the next little while, you can use Mars as your guide, or you can use um, the two brightest stars in, in Aries, Hamal and Sheridan. So kind of make a long skinny triangle, Uranus is below them by about, let's see, split the difference, about a fifth diameter below them. Or you can use the um, sort of the top of the uh, of Cetus, the whale, and it's about five degrees or about a, a skinny palm's diameter above those. And Uranus is um, magnitude five, so it's definitely binoculars. It's even naked eye for some people if they have good sky conditions, but uh, I haven't been able to do that, but I know people can do that. Um, and the one thing I wanted to say that I forgot about Neptune is that Neptune has a big moon. Let's see if I get the moon here called Triton. And Triton is, is very bright relative to the planet. And so Triton is actually relatively easy to see. It's only magnitude, it's magnitude 13. I mean, it's, it's a dim star-like point, but um, when you're looking at Neptune, if the sky conditions are good, and if you figure out where, where Triton is compared to Neptune, um, you can pick it up. You can see uh, the moon. Actually, Triton, a sort of Neptune's moon Triton is easier to see than Uranus's moons, just because it's relatively really? oh, wow. bright. Yeah, yeah. So it's a cool sort of challenge object to look at. Um, I think that's good. Um, anybody have any questions? There's a question about Pluto. Um, oh yeah. So it has been, it, I don't know if it was actually in conjunction with Jupiter, but it was certainly close by um, earlier this season. Uh, what do you think of trying to observe it when it's close by to those planets? I feel like it's easier to find that way, but that Jupiter would be so bright, it would be hard to see. So you gotta get so Jupiter out of the view. The trick, I think we actually um, talked about this. The trick with Pluto is that it's magnitude 14.27. So it's really, really at the limit for most amateur telescopes. I'll just go back to earlier in the summer. Yeah, so there you go, around the end of June, they yeah. were together. So it, Jupiter would be, was able to tell us where in the sky Pluto was, but in terms of seeing the planet itself, um, opposition is when it's at its peak, which is albeit not very much better than normal, but <laughs> it helps because it's, you know, it's, its distance from us is 33 astronomical units. And when it's not at opposition, the worst it can get is 35 because then we're on the far side of the sun. So 33 to 35 is not a huge difference compared to say Venus or Mars, which have a dramatic um, distance difference. So the trick that most people I know use is that they, they look up a star chart, 
of where Pluto is. And they, they just do a sketch and they come back and take a picture or do a sketch and come back the next night and see how the sky has moved. So you can see that in this particular case, this little star here, which is quite a bit brighter than Pluto, which would be much easier to spot, um, you could watch it and sort of figure out that. And if we go back to now, let's go back to August 25th. So you can see that there's, you know, magnitude 10 star there. So what you can do is you can sort of um, use your app or Stellarium and figure out when Pluto will be passing close to a, a star that's prominent and just kind of use that as your, as your trick to finding it. But it's, I don't know, I don't think I've seen it myself, it's but it's on hard. my bucket list. It's a bucket list thing. Yeah. Yeah, the closest I've gotten to it was one night doing um, outreach on the robotic telescope. We took a photo of Pluto early in the evening and a photo of Pluto late in the evening, like at the beginning of the session and afterwards. And you could see it just do a little like doot, 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 doot. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that was as close as we could get. And that was with a robotic telescope in an extremely dark site. So. so if I center on this star and I go one night to the next, so you can see how much it moves in 24 hours. It's a fair amount. Sort of. Yep. Yep. No, yeah. it's definitely possible if you sketch the star field and, and see what moved. Yeah. Might take some time and practice and it's certainly not a beginner object, but you could give it a try. That's right. I think that's, we, oh, we do have a question. Um, oh, this is more, this is, we have a couple. Um, this is a more personal to Southern Ontario. Um, Donal from Scarborough asks if uh, if there's a good place to stargaze between Toronto and Torrance Barrens. Um, and anywhere like about 45 minutes north of Toronto, I suppose, it gets to be pretty good if you can find a spot that's far enough away from towns. Uh, northeast or northwest, just don't go up Young Street, don't go up towards Barrie because you're sort of following the, the, oh, no. the light pollution. But if you head northeast or northwest, you're probably pretty safe between 30 and 30 and 60 minutes out of town. So yeah, you can, you can, oh, and then that also now is an opportunity to plug, uh, what is it, Dark Sight Finder? I think it's darksightfinder.com. Let me see if I can grab it. Um, I'll just share my screen so that you can see it. Uh, there's an app, there's a website, this is Dark Sight Finder, where you can go and look at the light pollution in your area. And so let's go into, it's, I mean, it's a bit tricky to see, but we can go into Toronto, um, which is probably this spot. Yeah, uh, and you'll want to you'll see how that there's that like corridor up there. So we've I've had good like we've both had good results somewhere like around even in the orange zone you can still see quite a bit. Um, but yeah, by the time you get to the yellow or the orange, you can see the Milky Way, which is pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Um. So the closest to well black really uh, is what you want to go for. Of course, that's a long ways and it's off highways generally speaking. So even Torrance Barrens, I believe this is probably, yeah, that's Torrance Barrens there. It's in the green and it's still pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, so you could go, if you're in Scarborough type area, you could go just up to north of Pickering or so and that would be about good. Um, but if you're going straight north, it's gonna be a long way before you get to darkness. Uh, east of Lake Scugog is a good dark location as well. That's, is that over near Peterborough? It's like over here? Uh, be north of, I can't see Skogog too well on this Is that map, it? But, uh, Are there? Lake Simcoe, I mean Lake Simcoe, Lake Simcoe. Oh, Lake Simcoe, okay, yes, yeah. so there's Lake Simcoe. So yeah, somewhere yeah. east of Barrie would be good too. Um, but this certainly helps for planning regardless of where you are. Uh, just, you wanna head out to wherever you can find the darkest skies. Okay, but you don't need that for you don't need that for planets. The great thing about no. planets is you can do them from home in your backyard or in your driveway, even with the street lights, right? Except for Neptune, you know, Neptune's tricky; it's it's dim. But uh, yeah, it's nice. It's, it's a nice accessible set of things to look at. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, we don't have any questions. Linda has said that she's going to go out and look for Neptune, and she's got some nice dark skies. So yes, let us know if you see Neptune. I'd love to see that, um, or I'd love to hear about it. And one last plug that I wanted to make is that you may have already seen this where uh, up on my tabs, um, one of our members uh, and also a science reporter for CBC, Nicole Mortolaro, has written a book. And it is a like an observer's handbook light. Uh, it combines, it has some information about how to do some basic observing. Um, and it also has all the important events for 2021. It is a 
while a lot of folks do like this and it gives you a ton of detail about a lot of stuff in terms of finding different objects in the sky and preparing for observing sessions this handbook so it's called the 2021 almanac and it's a little bit um it's a little bit more accessible and it's perfect for folks who uh well i was one of these people for a very long time see astronomical things happen on social media and get grumpy that i missed it um, it's perfect for that um, it's kind of so like FOMO, FOMO, but it's with a planet or a P or an A or something. Yeah. <laughs> Fear of missing out on planets. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, a, it's, you can't order it here. Well, you can't receive it yet. You can pre-order it and it comes out in October. Um, it's a great resource uh, for not missing out on fun astronomy things throughout the year um, and helping plan trips and stuff. So somebody in the chat was talking about the Chinese again. Let me just run through the planets in Chinese for you. So Mercury is Shuixing, that's the water planet. Venus is Jinxing, that's the gold or, or metal planet. We have the, um, uh, Mars is Huaxing, the fire planet. We have Jupiter is Muxing, wood. Saturn is Tuxing, that's uh, let's see, soil, earth or soil. We have Uranus, which is the Tianwangxing, that's the sea king, uh, sorry, the, um, the sky king. And then Neptune is Haiwangxing, Xing is star in Chinese. Uh, it's the sea king. And then the, um, Pluto is, I forget Pluto, but it's the underworld king star. Ooh, naturally. Oh, cool. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's really neat. I saw it uh, on recently on um, Twitter, somebody started a thread where they were posting um, different languages, astronomy terms. And I thought that was really fun. That's so very I wish cool. people, more people would do that. It's, it's neat to, um, to check out the different languages. And I'll briefly mention that in, uh, in Anishinaabemowin as well, which is um, the indigenous language spoken near where I am. Um, it's, and in a lot of Ontario, the names of the, and I, I'm, I hope I'm gonna this right. The names of the directions are named after the stars as well. And Nung means star. And so you'll get the name, I can't say them properly. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to try. I am trying to learn, but I'm not that good yet. <laughs> um, the names, the names of the directions are named after things like evening star and um, no stars for and or morning star and no stars. There's a lot to it. Eventually, oh, someday, cool. yeah. yeah, it's really, it's really neat. I really love hearing the origins of um, words that have to do with astronomy and likewise the names of ast astronomical things and where they came from as well. It's so cool. Um, last, last easy question. Thank you for pitching us an easy one. The name of the dark sky app is darksightfinder.com. I will copy and paste it into the chat and on YouTube. And with that, I believe we've covered all the questions. There we go. Awesome. Thanks everybody for joining today. It was lovely to hang out with you all. Um, please let us know uh, what, uh, fill out that survey once you're done. We're still not sure what's gonna be happening in the fall. We're gonna, we're gonna let you guys know as soon as we know. Um, and we'll also do our best to adjust to your schedules depending on what ha what's happening in the fall with you as well. Um, there's some big stuff going on at, at the national offices coming up in the next two months or so. So we'll see how our timing goes. Um, and no matter what, uh, we will see you at the very least for the opposition of Mars on October 6th. Yeah, we take requests. So send us a note if you think of something that you're curious about. Yes, we'll, we'll absolutely. We, are, we'll we already have our own super secret list of topics that we plan to do, but we're open to more, we do. more ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We, we, can, take, we can take some advice <laughs> and some suggestions. Thanks everyone. And we'll see you guys again soon. Uh, have a nice time out observing and oh, last plug. We have a speaker on Friday. If you guys are interested, he's really cool. He's 30 years old and he is an operator and an observer at the Canada, France, Hawaii telescope. Um, so that's going to be happening uh, Friday night at 7 PM. So come and join uh, and hear all about, and he's from Canada, the best part. He's from Nanaimo, BC. So, uh, so we're going to have that chat on Friday. Come and join us. It's on our website and we'll see you all soon. We'll get that dust off that old telescope. You don't need yeah. a big telescope to see Mars, to see Saturn, to see Jupiter. Any size telescope, dust it off, get it, get it outside. Pull it up from the basement. Go and take yep. a look. Yep. <laughs> take care, everybody. Christmas All right, see you, bye. Bye. Keep looking up. Keep looking up. Clear sky.